My name is Anissa Mitchell and I am with PMD Alliance and today I'm excited to um, introduce to you and I'm sure many of you already know Kat and Ken Hill. So Kat, you probably know really, really well. Kat is a big Parkinson's advocate, speaker, author, diagnosed at age 48. She has been a midwife in her career. Now she's focusing a lot of her time on advocacy. She has her website, cathill.org. She has a podcast called PD Lemonade, and now she's also an author, uh, co-authoring a book called Being Well with Chronic Illness. So I'm excited to have Kat, and Kat, I know I didn't cover everything, so I invite you to share a little bit more, but beside her is her loving husband, Ken, and I don't know that Ken has a website, and I don't have his bio, so I'm just going to introduce Ken to you and let him tell you a little about himself. Hello, everyone. My name is Ken. Um, I'm the, I don't know if you would say better half or not so better half of Kat. Uh, we've been That's married fair. for 33 years. Um, I've been, let's see, I've been like my professional career. What I do is I help people solve information technology solutions or problems. I've been doing that for like 30 years. Um, I'm kind of stepping away from that, getting more involved in some Parkinson's advocacy and some other non-technology, non-computer work. And um, right now we're coming from our travel trailer in uh, Lyle, Washington, which is are going to be our home for the next three months, but eventually will be our permanent home. And um, we're looking forward to that. So nice to meet everybody. Awesome. Kat, did I miss anything that you want to share with everyone? I don't think so. Just for sure, Ken is my better half. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, we, we are definitely better together than we are separate. So we have, I guess, three adult children. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. And we're, we've been living in 216 square feet for the last almost 18 months and we're still married. We figure that's the biggest nod to marriage that we can share. So <laughs> and probably contributes a lot of different types of intimacy so <laughs> ah indeed indeed <laughs> including learning some boundaries yeah so we can talk about that a little bit if you want but um I, i'm i'm really excited i think we're excited to be here today because i think it's a topic that that isn't always talked a lot about. And, um, and I think it's sensitive for a lot of people, especially here in the States. And, um, and I experienced that both as uh, a practicing midwife doing a lot of well woman exams and delivering women's babies, um, the things that I would bring up in the clinic. I, I just think it's an important conversation and an integral part of how we stay healthy is sexual health. And um, and not that intimacy is exactly the same thing as sex, but but intimacy can lead to us having a more fulfilled, healthy experience. Not just people with Parkinson's, but people that don't have Parkinson's too. So anyway, that's my little soapbox. And I'd love questions. Well, and I'm sure we're gonna get into them. And I just got a comment that the definition of intimacy is 216 square feet. So yes, <laughs> all yeah. forms. And we're gonna be talking about all forms today. So you mentioned that you've been married 33 years. Did I hear it correctly? You heard it correctly, but it's actually um, 30, we're coming up on, yeah, 33, coming up on 34. He's right. I stand mm -hmm, there. <laughs> <laughs> After this long, you start to kind of like the, the numbers kind of merge into each other. It's 668 years we've been married. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are obviously doing something right. So when you were diagnosed, Kat, how long were you married? I, I'm, you know, without, I'm not a math wizard. So like if, yeah. if yeah. so so the year um, that I was diagnosed was our 25 year wedding anniversary. Um, and, um, and we were both working full time. We had teenagers at home and um, yeah, it rocked our boat big time. Um, 
I I was the I mean we both made a good living I I made at the time more money than Ken Ken and I over the years have danced back and forth with that so it, that wasn't hasn't always been the case um, but I was just kind of getting into my peak earning time and um, I was the director of a busy inner city midwifery service and um, and it impacted us financially hugely. I I chose and was encouraged to leave because clinically I wasn't as sharp as I needed to be to manage all of those things. So financially, it put quite a bit of stress on us, um, and, and then a lot of stress about future. And and all of you can relate to this, right? It's it's the middle of life. It's peak earning times. It's not what you had planned. It's not. What, what do we do about retirement? What is retirement? How can we possibly even think about putting kids through college? So I like to say that female intimacy is often looks like a an air traffic control panel, right? So like in order to get in a space, Parkinson's or no Parkinson's, all of the things on the panel have to be in the right order right like the gauges have to all look right and when a lot of the gauges aren't going right in life it makes it hard to get in a space to be intimate um and and so i think what helped us lay the groundwork for getting through some of that was that we had good communication um and it's not always beautiful harmonious eloquent communication but it's communication and um I think that 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 helped us to get through those hard pieces. Right. Yeah. What do you think about that? I like your uh, analogy of the airplane control panel because, from my perspective, I, just, I you know I I'm a car guy, and I like old cars, and I need basically four gauges. You know, I need a fuel <laughs> tank, uh, an oil pressure, and then a speedometer, and maybe a um, tachometer. That's all I need to know to run my day. And, and to get intimate, I just need to know, is the tank full or not? Yeah, that's really, and it's, I, it's, I don't think it's necessarily a male female thing. I think it's probably a common difference across any relationship, whether any gender specific relationship that has some level of intimacy, there's going to be one person, I believe that just approaches it a little bit differently than the other one person it's much more complex and the other person is it's like ah eh, you know much more simplistic yeah and i think whether you're in a same sex relationship or in a um or same i'm not sure if i'm using the terms right same gender whatever it's complicated relationships are complicated yep. and you oh, add exactly. illness to that and you also add medications sometimes that have side effects that have arousal issues um you know ssris which are treat um depression and anxiety which are often prescribed for people with um, not just with parkinson's but with anxiety and depression um can really affect um uh, arousal, but also the ability to have an orgasm. And, and again, not that, not that orgasm equals intimacy, but it, it, it just layers complexity. All of those things are your kids at home. That always impacted me. I, you know, things needed to be quiet on the, you know, on the front, so to speak, everybody was either asleep or at school for me to feel comfortable getting intimate. Um, so anyway, that's you a, covered a lot just in the first right. few minutes. So I want to back up because we can unpack a ton of stuff that you guys just covered. So I want to start a little bit further back when you initially were diagnosed, you said it rocked your world. Obviously, we understand that. And you said some other things about how everyone responds a little bit differently, you know, stress shock, grief, you know, there's a little bit of grieving, grieving of what you thought you were in the height of your career, you had to, you know, give up your career. Um, it impacted your, your, your finances, like all of those things are losses. There are also um, huge stressors, and everybody deals with them differently. So that communication piece 
is really big, but everybody grieves differently. So I'm curious if you could chat a little bit about that, because I think that everyone can relate to that, whether you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's or not, we've all been dealt with major stressors in our life, grief in some form in our life. And if we're not communicating and we don't find a way to do that, it, it really does impact intimacy. And I'm not talking just sexual intimacy. I'm talking, that's a piece of it. Like you said, sort of a spectrum, um, but you can't have that really without having some interaction, you know, communication. So can you, can you talk about that a little bit? What that was experienced like for you? How did you navigate that and get through that? So when Kat was first diagnosed a few years before that, we had just started getting serious about like our non-working life. And we had started, you know, we, we've been pretty good savers and planning for retirement, but it was like, you're, we were busy raising kids and that was always on the back burner. And then finally we were at a point in our lives where we we're going, okay, let's start planning what's the next thing's going to happen. And we went to like retirement seminars where they tell you, this is what you should do. You need to do this and this and this, all that, you know, prescribed, uh, things, how much you should save, et cetera. And then when she got diagnosed with Parkinson's, we just were like, put on hold. It was just like, we had to reprioritize um, our plans. Everything. And that, that, and that included our intimacy. And we didn't realize that intimacy took the lowest priority, to be quite honest. And in hindsight, that's okay. I, I mean, um, and we eventually came around to realizing how it was impacting our intimacy. And a lot of it was not uh, intercourse related. It wasn't um, sexual related. It was communication. It was about, she was so focused on figuring out what was going on with her. And I was really focused on trying to figure out how are we gonna change our life when she's not going to work because we knew we kind of anticipated given her job she was not going to work pretty quickly and i was really the the person i am i'm my education is in economics and so i'm really kind of like this is how much money we need to do x y and z and not just economics his degree master's degree is in resource economics so it just makes it better yeah <laughs> And so at first we just ignored the intimacy. I mean, I felt like it. And, um, and I was grieving. I was, I was kind of laid out for many, to be perfectly honest, I was in shock and I was grieving and laying on the couch. I was depressed. Um, and, um, it was kind of taking everything, uh, that I had to just kind of get through the days. So I would agree with Ken that, that that became a lower priority. But what we learned was that that what we couldn't make a lower priority was talking to one another. And then it became about, okay, I miss dancing in the kitchen with you. I, I need a, I'd like to give you a hug and a kiss to start the day and send you off to work. And those pieces became increasingly important and in how we built back up some of that physical intimacy. I, I don't think Ken was scared of the physical symptoms, like, like hurting me. Um, uh, I'm pretty honest and I'm also pretty tough physically. It's hard to tell I'm short and a little saucy, but, but I'm usually pretty tough. Um, so I, I don't think that that was it. It was more about how can we stay close in a emotional way so that we're being honest with one another about what this process is like for us. And then that keeps the door open to the physical part and, and um, sort of on a, on a similar note, even though it's, it's different um, 
that, you know, that was kind of the beginning of the journey, kind of rebuilding that and remembering how much, you know, setting aside time to not just talk about Parkinson's or not just talk about the kids or about money, setting aside time, let's watch a movie together, let's cuddle on the couch, let's, um, let's hold hands, let's go for a walk, let's, um, remembering those pieces, remembering what all of our relationship was built in way, you know, back before the complicity of children and mortgage and jobs and um, Parkinson's. So it's been interesting. What I was going to say as a little side note in we've been living in this two hundred in uh, whatchamacallit uh, intimacy itself, but we have separate beds for the first time in our married life. We chose a model of Airstream that has two long twin beds in the back and we thought we've been married forever we don't have anything to prove blah 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 well we really miss sleeping in the same bed there's yeah. something about climbing into bed with one another and being close and I know some of you out there that have um some of the sleep stuff and acting out the dreams that can be really difficult and I think it's important to set aside time like we do to be close, even, even doing a webinar, right? We're right here next to each other. <laughs> right. If we're not sleeping in the same bed or the, you know, if you're not sleeping in the same room with your partner, making that time to sit next to each other. And anyway, I know I'm kind of all over the place. No, but I really appreciate all that you said, because what I I'm hearing is the basics of intimacy really is just the simple things like holding hands, looking each other in the eye, talking about something that's pleasant, not necessarily stressful or even mundane, like around taking care of the house and, and all of the things that we all have to deal with, um, how that can actually lead to the physical. But, you know, some people find it easier to be physical and not so easy to connect one-on-one. -on -one. So, you know, that's, that's something that is a challenge, you know, especially if they're not talkers, you know, if, if, and, and you mentioned like apathy earlier, there may be a lack of initiation, um, you know, any recommendations or thoughts about how to overcome when you have someone that may not be engaging or responding, even at attempts of like, of a spouse or a partner to, you know, be emotionally intimate, when you know they're just getting no response yeah i think that's hard um because i think that i think it's it's a complex question i think it's really okay to acknowledge that that's happening i i know that if 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 it were me and I had failed attempts to connect or or were kind of missing each other I mean, we've been together a long time. So it's, there's periods of time where we do miss or we miscommunicate. What, what I, I have found, and I'm not, an, I'm not an expert at this. I'm an expert at this, <laughs> but, but your relationship is your relationship. But what helps for me is in a time where I'm not feeling angry or hurt or upset, and the other person's not feeling angry, hurt, or upset to just bring it up and say, God, I feel like what I would say is, gosh, I feel like we haven't been connecting a lot. You know, have you been feeling that? Can we set up some time to either talk about it or to go do something? Not everybody wants to talk about it. Could, could I take you on a date? Ken sometimes would say that. Can we, you know, can we go out to dinner or can we do a date? And it doesn't have to be about spending money or, or getting naked, either of those things, but, but it could be, Hey, I'd love to make you dinner. You know, let me, let's order our favorite takeout. And um, so I think what it does take is energy. And I, and I see in some of the thread, mm -hmm. you know, I'm hearing things about exhaustion, about uh, maybe a sexless marriage. I mean, I think that there's a lot there. And I think it all comes back to if you love each other, and you choose to be and stay married, for whatever your reasons, you have to sometimes take the risk and bring up the topic. You know, it's, it's, and, and do it at a time where you're feeling strong, maybe, you know, don't do it at a time when you're feeling yucky. Um, because 
you know, and I think it's easy for the person with the disease. It's like, it, we're all aging, you know, the, it, things yeah. can happen. They happen to both of us. We're, I mean, Ken is, you know, significantly older, like two years, <laughs> but tech, <laughs> poor guy, he can't get away from it. But, but yeah. if you feel like you have, you're having a sexless marriage or relationship to me, that's a key message that you need help. And it's okay to go see an intimacy counselor. Yeah. I really believe in that. Um, and I mean, I've done my own counseling, not around intimacy specifically, but for my own stuff as a care partner, as someone who's been sober for 10 plus years. And I have my networks that I can work with on, on counseling. And some of it overlaps with intimacy and our relationship. And that's a safe spot to do it. And so if you're feeling like you're having like that sexless marriage, it's okay to reach out for some, some help. It really is. Or if you feel stuck. I think um, I, I, I go in and out of therapy I feel very lucky to have those tools because it's a safe space for me to work on me. And part of an integral part of me is us. Right. And, um, and, and I think I want to feel like I'm always learning and growing. And, and I, I think Ken feels the same way, but that takes work and it takes commitment. And sometimes it takes going to those hard places of, man, this feels uncomfortable. Um, and, and man, it's really different than it used to be. I mean, we can just talk about aging, right? You know, menop menopause, perimenopause, um, uh, hormone levels dropping for both of us. What, you know, how does that look like? Um, or what does that look like? Are there ways to be physically close and intimate that are, are different, that, that meet our needs, that aren't always sex related to, um, and, and then I, I also think it's really fair to talk about, um, talk about it with our providers. You know, it's something that people don't bring up, women in particular. Um, you know, it, it, Ken talking about the, the car mechanics versus the airplane mechanics, right? If you want to put um, that, that there are some medicines and certain um, all kinds of health related things that can make it difficult for us to enjoy being intimate there, but there's all kinds of tools and lubes and medicines and this and that if you need help, but you have to reach out for it and it's uncomfortable, but why I always wonder why that is we're so comfortable talking about you know, shaking and what our brains are doing or, you know, the shuffle, but no, very few providers are comfortable. Of you don't like to ask, I think. Um, it feels private, right? It does. And, yeah. But yet it is a huge aspect of quality of life for people. And right. it's just, you know, maybe they don't, I, I can't speak to it, but I have had providers tell me before that they, didn't feel equipped to answer those problems and may not know that there's resources out there that really can help. And, you know, you comment earlier um, that I think goes along with this is that, you know, you know, people who are diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's tend to live a long time. They're married a long time. And so if we're not addressing these issues early, whether it's communication or the physical issues that you're trying to navigate, then you live a long time being very unfulfilled. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I don't want to speak for all care partners as an, as a nurse and as a midwife, I know that, that taking care of people <clears throat> is an exhausting, hard job. Sometimes being a caretaker and sometimes being a care partner um, is a very, very hard job. And I think sometimes it's also can be difficult to see the person you're taking care of still as also a sexual being. And so I, I, I fortunately, we're not quite at the point where Ken's having to do a lot for me physically. He does a lot more in our, in our world, taking care of things for our lives here than he used to. 
Um, but I think sometimes you have to switch off the care partner hat and allow for a date night where um, where you can be a couple again. Um, my dad had Parkinson's, Ken's grandfather had Parkinson's, and I know for both my stepmom and Ken's grandmother, um, they they were caretaking full time and it, and to allow some time for for to for closeness it again i think is important so so you brought up some really good points so you know i know that for the care partners um it's hard to switch from constantly doing to just being you know present to be able to connect intimately whether it's emotionally or physically. Um, I've heard it called bridging time where people need okay. to kind of have a moment to like switch gears because it's just really difficult to go to that, you know, place when you've been revving at 16, you know, miles an hour the whole day. And then the other thing is that, and, and I'd love to get your perspectives on this is, you know, people getting so fixated on the task of helping their loved one that they quit identifying them relationally as the spouse, but, you know, as the care partner. And I've actually had care partners say, oh, hi, I'm the care partner. I'm like, oh, what, are you married? Are you partnered? What's in there? Like, oh, I'm their spouse. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, let's talk about that. Yeah. I, I see somebody wants to know if they have questions. Yeah, Could just you, drop it in the chat. Stick we'll, it in the chat. Yeah. And we'll, um, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I, um, because I've, from, I've had over the past 10 years living with my, with Kat, with Parkinson's, I've, I've always in the back of my head have had difficulty with the, the phrases care partner and caregiver. Um, because there's times where I feel like one of those, and there's a lot of times where I don't feel like it at all. And, um, and I really try and I, I just don't like putting labels on what my role is in this relationship. My role is I'm, I'm her spouse and that's my role. And we got married, we're married and we made vows you know, and to the traditional, you know, till death do you part in sickness and in health. Well, this is what we're in. You know, we are in both sickness and in health. And we've been like that even before she was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, and uh, our roles are changing. And so I think as a, as a partner of a person's with Parkinson's, I mean, that's, a, that's another label. Um, what I've been noticing, my most difficult challenge I have on intimacy is, is realizing that there's a connection between the amount of stuff going on in our lives and our, and our intimacy. There's a relationship there. And I think for somebody with Parkinson's, I had another caregiver tell me this. Somebody with Parkinson's, I think they, their brain can only take so much information, so many things going on at one time. And we've had a lot of stuff going on this past year and a half. We sold a house. We changed how we're going to live. We're traveling around the country. That is a lot of stuff. And did it, we mention in 216 square feet? And <laughs> oh, I think we did. And oh, we did. Throw okay. something <laughs> new in there. Um, how you know intimacy? It. The, I I really believe Cat has it's it's more difficult for her to process than she would, was able to process 15, 20 years ago. And for me, it's a little bit different, but I think it's more significantly different with somebody with Parkinson's. And I have to remind myself that. I have to remind myself that if I'm noticing I'm wanting to be intimate and she's not, what I need to do is, is do a double check and go, okay, we got to take care of something else first and get that off the plate. Or maybe he cleans the kitchen right ladies any you know the sexiest thing is <laughs> i know or sweep or you know cat cat has used this this concept of spoons like how many spoons you can have stacked in your life um, for a day. And, mm -hmm. or a day and i i really think that impact uh, that's a direct um 
directly related to our, our intimacy. We can, we have one of those spoons have to be reserved for intimacy mm -hmm. and it has to be somewhere in the stack. Right. Right. And sometimes the stack, those of you that have Parkinson's, the stack may run out at noon one day. And then the other day it may, there may only be a window of an hour. And what I've gotten better at, and, and I'm not, it's funny. So I talk about all this stuff, like I'll talk about anything to anybody, but, but, but I'm kind of shy uh, personally, believe it or not. You know, when I had my babies, I wasn't all naked out on a farm somewhere. I was nicely draped and, you know, anyway, right. uh, so I've gotten better at communicating and bringing things up. I, I want to um, add something. I'm not watching the chat thread, but um, if you are a person with Parkinson's or a partner, a spouse, caregiver, whatever, and you are having difficulties with intimacy and you don't know where to start, um, I would suggest doing your own reading. There's a whole bunch of online blogs about intimacy. One of my favorites is called Slate. And some of it might be edgy for some people, um, but it's it's like a Dear Abby on sexual relationships and in intimacy across all kinds of domains of individuals and lifestyles. If I believe that's helped me with getting more comfortable talking about intimacy issues, sexual I issues with my wife and even with our kids. Um, and it's okay to read that kind of literature. And I think it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. I know somebody wanted to ask a question, but was having trouble. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So actually we have it now set that they can unmute. So Heather actually has a question. And so Heather, if so, you so are there and able to unmute yourself, um, we'll go ahead and let you ask your question. Thank you so much, because I use voice to text applications almost exclusively, as Kat and Ken both know. They've gotten some weird texts for me, <laughs> pick up the rap songs that I'm listening to in the background. Sorry for yelling. Um, but but I want to say, Kat and Ken, you show up with such integrity, and you show your loyalty. You don't talk about it. You just do it. You are practicing what you're preaching here, which is why I'm so eager to continue to listen. And your authenticity just really shows. And you've been there for a lot of people. And I don't know how you do it. You must have extra spoons. But I was going to ask you, what do you think of people engaging in more play, like reading erotica to, to each other and sort of awakening their body with the senses? You know, smelling is not really the forte of all parkies, but we, we, might, we might find something that we can still smell. Or what about just touching and holding each other for a while? Like you mentioned, it doesn't have to be like, you know, bang on, you know, let's go. It can always be like, hey, let's touch each other. How healthy is this? Pleasure is our birthright. And so I just want to say that that sort of creative energy that we right. can have. We, you're right. We need to save that spoon because we really need this. Whether you have a partner that's consistent or not, we have to have some sort of release from this and, Parkinson's. And I want to give single people permission to explore those realms as well because I think that that sexual health is an integral part of health period um and i think um i think it's just important that we remember that and and being touched and being close and being um okay so i'm going to talk about smell for a second um i don't smell very well but we had a new experience <laughs> this week um our dog got sprayed by a skunk <sighs> now our dog lives with us in 216 square feet and skunk it has put a damper on intimacy i will tell you that <laughs> um so it's a good kind of reverse reminder that that you know having a dog not smell like smug skunk will probably help our intimacy yep. so we are looking forward to reporting back on that um I, I keep coming back to this 216 square feet and i i do it because i've learned that i have some some boundaries about my own intimacy and about my own way of processing my sadness and frustration we, we lived in a house that had like real doors before and um 
and we had real rooms that we could go in and have privacy in a in a travel trailer as lovely it, as it is you can go outside um but there's not a lot of room to process and i'm learning that i need a little bit more space and a door to close to have some of my own emotions and Ken seen way more of my emotions than he used to because yep. we used to have doors to shut. And, and I don't think that's all bad. I think that that's learning on my part, but I think that's pushed our communication and intimacy and sometimes not in very eloquent or nice ways. Like, no, just leave me alone. I need to be by <laughs> versus me sneaking off and going to the basement with a closed door to go, you know, or whatever. Um, so I think that that we've also learned, like we got noise canceling headphones and um, and we can draw a curtain, which is helpful. So it, it lets us feel like we're in our own space. Um, and uh, somebody's asking, can you elaborate more on the challenges of joy traveling together? I will say that that's one of the things, even both of us doing um, calls and being in each other's space, we've had to learn to navigate some of that. Um, I, I would say that that traveling with Parkinson's has pushed me in some ways that has been healthy. Um, I think it's also helped me define and learn some boundaries that perhaps I didn't know I had. Um, like I can talk all day long about sex, but what I don't want to talk about is constipation. And I, <laughs> I have limits and I don't, <laughs> you know, my bowels are mine. And I don't think that other people need to be involved in my bowels. And if I need to talk about my bowels with someone, I'll do it in private in an exam room with my provider. Thank you very much. But so, so I've had to learn some of those things. Um, and I can't believe really that I just said that, but. So Heather, about your question about touch, one of the most intimate things that we've been doing the last, we've been up at our property here up at Lyle for about a month now. And one of the most intimate things we've been doing is sitting here watching TV because we get really good tv channels up here and what we're watching are old tv shows from the 1970s that we watched growing up totally inappropriate for today's totally inappropriate <laughs> like quincy and magnum pi you know just cheesy detective stuff but we're sitting i mean we're cuddling with each other and it's like the most one of the most enjoyable times that i've had in with her in a long, long time. Until the dog got sprayed by the skunk. Yeah. It's been a little less enjoyable because he's right here on our lap. He's a little tiny Yorkshire Terrier. So, but we'll get back to that. In a couple and that weeks, kind probably. of intimacy, it has not led to intercourse. And that's, Not all the time. Not all the time. And, and it's, it's, it's not supposed to always end in intercourse. I mean, if uh, that's, how, that's my philosophy. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I like that you give that permission because mm -hmm. sometimes you just want to be close and cuddling without it leading to something and having an end game. And other times it, it does. Like I said, like Heather just said, no pressure. So that's really important. I'm, and communicating it yes. and communicating it, being able to say, I, you know, I would love to cuddle, but I'm not up for more. Um, I like to say it at the outset because I think um, I've learned over the years that it's okay to say that. I think that um, being a female born in the 60s, there was conditioning around enjoyment of men and expectations of that. And so I think that I forgot that I could have a voice in all of that. And not that anybody was, you know, Ken's never been inappropriate or forceful. It was my own psyche. It was my own, you know, uh, what an air traffic control panel, you know? So um, that's been a nice growth thing for us. I also think that doing the work that I did and raising children in today's world pushed us to have a lot of those kind of conversations with our kids so so that maybe they could have healthy or healthier um, relationships around sex and intimacy as they moved into adulthood so 
So I want to switch gears a little bit sure. because one of the things that I really want to make sure that we cover are maybe some conversation pieces around this topic that nobody else is willing to, to uncover, you know? So I don't even know what that is, but you guys are out there, you're talking to other people, you, you know, you know what people are not getting addressed. Um, and so I want to open that up and just allow you guys to venture into maybe some uncharted conversational territory in a live stream. If you okay. can think of something, not to put you on the spot, but like, I know right. that we kind of talked beforehand that there may be some things that aren't being talked about that people really need to be given that opportunity to, to have the surfaced. You know, I, I know, I know for, um, for me that, that I was one of the, those folks, I was diagnosed with anxiety far before I was diagnosed with Parkinson's and really the anxiety didn't get addressed well until I started taking medicines to treat the Parkinson's. So I took medicine for quite a while, uh, an SSRI medicine, which really made it hard for me to have an orgasm. I'm just going to put it out there. And I think that nobody was asking me about that. And so having sex became felt different was different for me and and we didn't talk about it for a while but I, instead of talking about it we kind of just I I didn't initiate or respond as much to Ken and I think him being able to say I really miss being close with you and that was a really brave scary thing for him to say because who who knows what I could have responded and I had to think about it and we started to talk more about it and and so talking to one another about some of those things you know that's not working so well for me or he, people can't know unless we bring it up folks our providers can't know that we're not that we're not happy in that arena or that we need some help. They can't know that we need to maybe adjust medicines or talk right. about side effects of medicines. And, and our partners can't know if we can't even talk to them. Um, and, and I also think I'm going to come back to if we can talk about it. Yeah. And that's a great point um, I'm looking in the chat here um, it may take more work to achieve climax for both men and women who are on medicines and so talking about how you're going to navigate that um, and and also remembering that that orgasm isn't isn't just intimacy you know can we take a shower together um, we miss that too our shower <laughs> in the, the air she barely fits one of us so it's definitely not going to fit two um and and um you know I I just think you have to also think about I I think about like when we first met and when we were young and had some of those feelings what did we do then what was so charming then and um some of it I'll admit was watching all these corny television shows that we watch now <laughs> um but, but a lot of things, you know, Ken's a great cook. Um, I, I don't know, does that make sense? So I, I think getting creative, being brave, and also not forgetting to talk to your providers. Um, um, are there alcohol and drug issues? Those can affect intimacy. They can affect how you interact with one another. Right. Um, and uh, and, and I think there ju there's just help out there. And it's, it's our, like Heather said, it's our birthright to have joy and pleasure and intimacy and sex are part of that. And it's part of how we stay healthy. Instead of looking at it as this taboo thing, let's, let's take back a hold of it, folks. Let's own it. And you don't have to own it to anybody else besides yourself and maybe your partner um you know it's not it doesn't have to be a taboo issue your providers may not be super comfortable with it but they might be able to refer you to somebody who is um talking um looking it up on the internet read some things yeah i've had i you know for me there was a time 
where I started reading about the medications and the side effects that cat was taking. And I could re realize, I, I, that's when I learned that, okay, those medications are impacting her ability to orgasm or we're not orgasming at the same time or where we were before Parkinson's happened. And so then we just needed to figure out how do we get back in sync? And there are ways of doing that. There are, you know, there are sex toys. There is lubrication that needs to be talked about because um, the Not body, -menopausal. the body in postmenopausal doesn't lubricate like it used to. And it's more difficult for both cat and for me. Um, and it's, and it's, that's what the kind of stuff, if you want to talk nitty gritty, that's the kind of stuff you need to talk, start talking with your partners about. Even yeah. if you don't want to talk about constipation, exactly. I give you permission to talk, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, yeah, what, let's see, what so, medications have changed, changed my sex, sex life? life. Mm -hmm. So, um, you're on Repenerol, <laughs> <laughs> that agonist. Yeah. Sometimes so, we miss it. <laughs> <laughs> so Repenerol um, worked really, really well for my stiffness. Um, and and at, at a certain dosing also tipped me into sort of into that hypersexual realm. And, and that can happen um, very quickly. And it's important that we know that that's a side effect. Ken and I, my, our provider, my neurologist had talked to Ken and I both about that being a potential and to watch out for that for a while we enjoyed it but it was also coupled with me not sleeping um and and that wasn't healthy and so I think it's important that that, that so that that was a Parkinson's medicine that affected me kind of my libido it really speeded sped up my libido the, the SSRI medicine, the SSRI medicines in general that I've been talking about are things like um, Lexapro, which is uh, Citalopram, Citalopram. There's several generations of those medicines that can make it harder or take longer to achieve an orgasm for folks. Um, and there's all kinds of other things that happen in our lives, like, you know, diabetes can affect that, heart disease. Uh, blood pressure medicines. So the more we age, both, both of us, right, not just me, but the more things I will tell you when Ken broke his tibia and fibula uh, and was in a cast and couldn't move that very much impacted our intimacy. And I really became the primary caregiver, bless his heart. And I learned how to order Uber Eats a lot and all <laughs> kinds of new skills. But um you know, it's, it's the dance. And if you're committed to being married and having an intimate relationship, uh, I think it's important to be, feel safe doing that. Somebody's asking ages. I am, let me think how old I am. I was 48 when I was diagnosed and I'm 56 now. And Ken is 58, much older. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we're moving into that, that next phase. So it's, uh, it, it's worth it for us. It may not be worth it for everybody. Uh, are we attentive to sleep habits? I've gotten very attuned to sleep habits. And I think both Ken and I I don't understand the question. Like habits, how we sleep, like our sleep schedules and how we I think both of us know we do better when we're rested. Um, I go in waves with PD where I'm awake more and then I sleep better. Um, so yes, I would say we're attentive to our habits. Um, I'm, they're not always good habits. Is that fair? <laughs> yeah, that's a, um, I will, we have to be careful because there's going to be activities that will like if we have a very packed day, there's going to be a high likelihood that the next day or two days um, are going to do a, a big impact on cat sleep. Yeah. Um, and so 
we have to, that's another thing we have to plan and anticipate for. So we can't pack. So if we're going to have, if we know we're going to have like a lot of activities on a specific day, we get, I have to, I, and I think Kat does the same thing, has to like have a cushion on the next day that, okay, this might be a down day where we just don't do anything. Or that I don't. And I also yeah. totally, you know, when, we, when we were traveling overseas, we, um, Ken would be comfortable going off and doing his thing. And I was comfortable doing a, you know, less, uh, less activity, you know, back at the whole hotel. I'm trying to follow some of these questions. Um, well, and I can help you with that. There is somebody wanting to know about um, those who might be single or have no options for sex. What would you recommend? So I think First off, being aware about your medicines, you know, can you still, if, if you are interested in, in achieving climax, I think that there are, uh, there's all kinds of ways. It depends a little bit on, there are sex toys, there are um, uh, self-pleasuring um, uh, videos, there's, I'm sure there's blogs, there's all kinds of stuff that, that can help you to achieve a climax, because I think it, it, it's important. And I think we don't talk about it enough. I promise, I you would, know, parts are not going to fall off if you choose to masturbate. I mean, yeah. it sounds like such a bad word. Why can't we talk? I about would, it? that person, I would suggest look up slate on Google slate and read that newsletter. A re get, uh, subscribe to it. It's it's kind of like a Dear Abby forum. People write in what their sexual difficulties are, their intimacies are, and they frequently talk about masturbation. And there's a lot of shame around it that is just out there in society, especially I think more so in Western American culture than other co cultures around the world. But you can have intimacy and be single and have a healthy sexual life being single. And it's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah I think it's just I think it's just important and and just because and, and even married folks that are in not in sync I think it's important to give permission that you that you can meet your own needs and that's okay that doesn't mean you love your partner any less it doesn't mean your partner is letting you down it just means that you may have a need at the time and your partner doesn't and that's okay um so and I also think as diseases progress and age progresses and it, that may be you may not stay in sync forever it it may not be something and i certainly wouldn't want ken to not have that part of his important health in if i'm not able or um uh willing or yeah willing or able to help with that does that make sense i in other words i want ken's sexual health to be healthy even if my is out of whack with his i know it's it, it's funny people are thanking us for talking about it. i i appreciate it more um, be, and i guess part of it is that that it's it's if we don't talk about it it makes it more taboo right and and um it's just a part of who we are it's not everything so anyway it is true separate beds for sleep hygiene is helpful sometimes especially if someone's yeah. dealing with like as you mentioned earlier like REM sleep behavior disorder, yes. disorder that can actually be dangerous sleeping in the same bed right. but that doesn't mean you're right. in you're sleeping all the time so right. you know you can be intimate at other times and another thing that I would maybe like to touch on just briefly we only have a couple more minutes left but you know uh you sort of referred to it but like when someone is not optimally medicated, meaning they're off, you know, um, they're, they're not going to be able to necessarily engage in, you know, intercourse or whatever as well. So, you know, people feel really strange, maybe at least in Western culture, as you referenced that, you know, scheduling intimacy, sexual intimacy is not necessarily a bad thing. If you know that there are certain times of the day that, you feel more on and more physically capable of of engaging in in intercourse 
hundred percent. So, so pre pre Parkinson's kind of, I had a weird schedule because I was a midwife and I'd be at the hospital for long hours. Ken worked at home. We found that with teenagers at home, that the best time for us was when they were at school and I had slept pretty well and he had a break in his day. So it had nothing to do with Parkinson's, but it had to do with our life and all of the pieces, and we found a time that worked for us. By no means what are we talking every single day, folks. You, uh, but 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 when when things collided and the schedules aligned, I would say, "Hey, are you free?" Or, "Hey, honey, what are you wearing?" You know, <laughs> which was like the cue, like you want to be wearing less, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'll meet you upstairs in twenty minutes. So. So it's not just about timing with Parkinson's and timing. It's it's about all of the timings. Yeah. And yes, Parkinson's becomes a greater and greater part of how we plan ourselves and our worlds. I know for me, my symptoms, uh, even after orgasm, will be way heightened for a while. Um, and and that doesn't mean it's awful. It's totally worth it, right? But I but I think that even knowing that is important, and and that's okay. Uh, I love it. Becca, Rebecca says, agreed that timing is key and taking advantage of when all seems to be working and the planets are aligned. Amen. Um, you know, there. Uh, so I, I just think we, we just need to remember it's complex and we need to give ourselves a break and we need to not make it bigger than it is. It's just exactly. a part of it. It's yeah. And I, th I also think that a lot of this, we would be going through even didn't have parkinson's yeah menopause happens ladies yep. you know pluses or minuses <laughs> but but it happens you know it's and i will tell you perimenopause and parkinson's was no um cakewalk and all of that affected my ability to feel even desirable right i was shaking and baking i mean and i didn't want to be in my own skin much less have anybody else touching me so it's just interesting and it's not talked about enough so well and and on the side of the male you know for them they may not have menopause but you know they can experience erectile dysfunction and that can just be a part of aging anyway is also can be an issue with parkinson's so absolutely this is an important Piece absolutely it. and and being comfortable to bring it up with your provider you yeah know, so it for us men, you gotta watch your you gotta get a get your testosterone check you know there's a lot of stuff around testosterone not just with intimacy and sexuality but just energy mm -hmm. level and just health health in general mm -hmm. um yeah so anyway, I hope this has been helpful for folks. <laughs> it, well, based on all of the comments and just, you know, listening to you, absolutely. And one of the things that I love is, is just even in your description of, you know, hey, what are you wearing? You want to wear <laughs> less, like that fun, you know, and that playfulness and being a little risque. There's nothing wrong with that. So, like, that's just right. fun. And have make games. I mean, like, like when we were traveling in Europe, we had a game. We're gonna have we're gonna have intercourse in every country that we go to. That's right. <laughs> and and we did. And we did. <laughs> and you know, Ken's hoping for a lot more countries soon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, it, yeah. You know, it makes you feel young again, yeah. you know, and, and, and I want to be, I'm, I don't want to be young again. I want to be me, but I want that freedom and that feeling, and you can make that happen. Um, and humor. I think we have to laugh. We have to laugh. And I think, um, laughing at ourselves and being willing to laugh together is really important. Anyway, th I, I'm so honored that you guys came out to. Well, this and we're so honored that you would tackle this topic that not everybody likes to talk about so thank you so very much for joining you're us welcome today. and if anybody on this call wants to talk one-on-one -on -one with me and i'm sure kat would probably say the same thing you can get our contact information from anissa and we'd be happy to just have a conversation outside of this group forum yeah oh, thank yeah. you for offering that well, now I'm going to invite everybody to, if they don't have their screens on, please turn on your screen because I think Kat and Ken very much deserve a wave of gratitude.
And um, yeah, there's some emojis out there. Those work too. So actually, I'm going to give you the heart because today, you know, the intimacy, I think the heart is appropriate. So I'll give you a wave and a heart. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks everyone oh, for thank joining you. us. Thank you for coming out. Thanks, everybody.